So if anybody was able to attend the exhibitor forum uh, at the last supercomputing, um, we were uh, basically releasing Ultra uh, in, a, in a marketing sense at that time uh, and are very excited to have it GA'd as of a couple weeks ago. Uh, so whereas at that talk, I talked a lot about the problems we were trying to solve, uh, what made them innovative, uh, and how we solve them. Uh, in this talk, I kind of do a retrospective, almost uh, you know, as a sense of nostalgia looking back over the project, uh, but also prior to that project, you know, what did we learn over the last 20 years as a storage company? Um, how were they applied to uh, the OSDs that we, that we still sell in Prime? Um, and uh, what could we have done better? So first I'll talk about, you know, what's just an, what's an OSD in case you're not familiar or haven't cared to look at any of the details about them. Um, what makes them so important? Uh, talk about classic OSD hardware and software. Uh, again, like what we could have done better, what we've learned from those 20 years of experience with them. Um, and then, you know, how we applied those lessons uh, in Ultra. So in OSD, uh, if we go up to like 50,000 feet, uh, you really see clients, direct flow clients, uh, active store directors, and the OSDs at the bottom. And people are very familiar with this picture or something very similar to it. Um, the important thing to call out here is that everything is a component. You can think of a component as the atomic unit of storage in PanFS. So if you have a directory, uh, at least on modern systems, that's a four-way mirror. If you have a small file, that'll be a three-way mirror. And as that file grows to a large file, potentially, uh, that'll get broken up and erasure coded uh, into potentially dozens of components that is spread out across OSDs and accessed in parallel and out of band by, by your clients. So um, this out of band you know, metadata management, which is one of our key features, uh, basically allows for, for scaling. That's what, we, that's what we serve to do is scale, uh, one of our primary focuses. Um, and the OSDs help us do that. So zooming in on one of those individual OSDs, you can see, you know, that's, that's our data storage target. Um, if it persists, if it has to persist, if it's the metadata or the data associated with a file or directory, um, and it's not like a configuration option or something like that with the realm, it has to live on an OSD. It's our most numerous component, uh, and that actually makes it one of our most important components. Uh, you know, a lot of people say, like, the smarts of PanFS are in the ASD, and that is absolutely the case. PanFS is in the client and in the ASD from, like, a coherency and consistency perspective, um, but the performance is in the OSDs, and that was something that we kept circling back to, like, okay, we really have to look hard at these if we want to continue to be the performance leader in this space. Um, per realm, you're going to have a far fewer number of directors compared to OSDs, and just by the numbers, that, that tells that story. It has simple and fast interfaces for, for data and management. So iSCSI on the data side, uh, RPC on the management side, um, those APIs haven't drastically changed over those 20 years, and that's by design. Uh, you know, we want to make access to that data, um, those OSDs, as simple as possible, but that doesn't mean the OSD is simple. Um, and that is, that is a really important um, consequence that I'll talk about later. A failure domain, this is not something uh, many vendors talk about, but uh, failure is a natural part of storage, right? You know, it will fail. It is made of moving components. Even if it's not made of moving components, it will burn out, it will fail. You have to define a failure domain, and you have to say, what is the atomic unit of that failure domain? And for us, it's an OSD. And so understanding how it can fail, you know, fixing failures where possible, or just addressing, you know, adjusting to those failures at the higher level, that is all done at a, you know, at the OSD level, and as such, you'll only ever store one component of your files or directories on an OSD. And last, each OSD has an internal file system. Um, this is basically how we take the component that's coming in as ingest via iSCSI and put it onto the disks or SSD. Uh, so in the past, as you can see here, because this is more of like a classic architecture, we have our copy and write file system, that's our Panassas proprietary version, and that accepts the metadata and the data and manages everything, like just accepts it wholesale into the kernel and, and applies it just like a normal local file system you're running on your Linux server would. So the OSD is our speed of light. You know, why care about an OSD? I, I mentioned that this is what drives uh, performance in Panassas and um, the individual, you know, an individual I.O. to an individual file is driven by the OSD. So that's not just the interface, that's not just the disks, it's also like how we cope with the requests as they come in. So one thing we do is we have to track and process like interwoven requests. If you have creates 
and those are followed up closely by writes, we'll know exactly how, you know, how much you're attempting to write. And we might decide to put it in one place or the other based on that write. You know, deletes that might come in after, you know, at some point after a write, if they arrive out of order, we have to like hope with those things. All of these interdependencies are handled in the OSD software and are dealt with transparently, which is why a lot of people consistently think that they're simple devices when they're not. We also prioritize foreground I.O. over background I.O. So if we have a reconstruction running or if we have ACB running, active capacity balancing running, we make sure that we're not like degrading foreground performance. And that's another thing that just silently happens in the background. Even some of the engineers don't realize that this, this queuing occurs inside the OSD. Snapshots and copy on write. This is one of the hardest things that I've dealt with as an engineer um, in file systems, like full stop. Uh, if you have a copy on write file system, that's tough. If you layer snapshots on top of it, which you should, because it is copy on write, and that's where they benefit the most, um, you can really create a complex file system. So you have to do this, and you can do this, but doing it without slowing down your file system just adds like this third component of difficulty, um, and that's something that OSD has to handle completely transparently inside of itself. Um, the rebuilds will need to understand this copy on write when they go to rebuild your entire snapshot chain inside of an OSD. Internal and transparent tiering. Um, tiering gets talked a lot about in, in our field. Uh, most of that's external. You tier because your storage got cold. You know, some files got cold or a project directory got cold, whatever. Um, and that's certainly a legitimate use case for tiering. But tiering inside of an OSD, in my opinion, is a lot sexier because you can, you can just send data to a specific storage target and then let it figure out if it's cold, if it's hot but then go right back to it and you're not moving data over a network to escalate it from a cold area to a hot area. It's happening right across the motherboard. And that's, that's a really powerful thing. Um, it doesn't get in the way of foreground processes uh, and, and that's how we prefer to approach tiering as you'll see in Ultra. We've added more tiers because we think it's that powerful of a concept. Um, you have to maintain consistency while you're tiering at these different places and different devices um, and matching the media to those, you know, the media and its characteristics to the different components that are coming down, whether they be small files or directories or whatever, uh, that's all part of the smarts that have to be built into the OSD. An OSD is constantly improving itself. Uh, it will do all kinds of background tasks, defrag, uh, checking for bit rot. We had a whole conversation earlier about the thing that never gets talked about, that, you know, cosmic rays or, you know, mag the guy that walked by the, the shelves with the, you know, super magnet or whatever, like this, this occurs, you need to detect bad blocks, you need to report them to the higher level if you can't fix them, in our case, PanFS. Um, and you have to manage your caches, manage your tiers intelligently. All this stuff has to happen within an OSD in PanFS. Consistency and coherency. Uh, we don't want people sending random requests to our OSDs, uh, so they have to be authenticated as legitimate, and we have to make sure that you are actually given access to, you know, try to write something a thousand bytes into, you know, component X. Um, so that is all working in tandem with the ASDs, uh, but still something that the OSDs have to check so that you don't get these out-of-band requests to change change data that could be uh, quite problematic. Um, and last, we have to report if uh, hardware is failing. Uh, hardware fails all the time. And in a lot of like the non-appliance approaches to storage, you don't get notification about it. You just have to react when it happens. Um, one, of our, one of the deepest ways we've entangled ourselves with the storage that we ship today and the storage that we'll ship tomorrow with Ultra is that we look at the hardware as it's failing via smart, via network, uh, you know, network counters or what have you, temperature sensors, and report as soon as something is going awry so that you can react to it. Because we, we always prefer you to react to it rather than just wait until you've lost an entire OSD or series of OSDs because of an environmental problem. So, in, you know, in summary, why to care? It's you, you keep the complex inside so you can be simple outside and you can build a complex parallel file system around a simple interface. Um, we could not have built PanFS if we made the OSDs really thorny uh, to work with because PanFS is already really complicated. All parallel file systems are really complicated. So if you can keep your, your storage target simple, then you can build really complex things uh, that you can trust to work. So looking at the classic OSD, this is basically how the uh, software stack breaks down. iSCSI and RPC uh, interfaces at the top. You have a command queuing structure for iSCSI commands that are coming in. Um, this command queuing will basically say, 
okay, you've tried to do a write, accept the write, but you know you need to wait on this much data that's gonna follow. And as soon as that comes over the wire, then you've assembled that iSCSI request and you can turn it into a task. Once it becomes a task, you can do prioritization. So, and that's like basically our semblance of QoS. Um, and then once the task is actually being executed, it will go through our object orchestration layer that manages the entire API into our object, our object storage, basically, that, that underpins all of our, our file system. In the classic OSD, we had our own proprietary, uh, still have our own proprietary OSD copy on write based file system that takes our SATA hard drives and our SATA SSD and puts them together, wraps them all under one namespace and then deals with the fact that you might be writing small, something small or you might, be, you might have a directory or whatever and it transparently copes with all that. It's totally in kernel um, and that's, that's how all that works. I see that some animations were added to the slide, sorry. <laughs> so now I uh, will regurgitate roughly what, what, yeah, I guess I said most of all this. So that was, uh, I'll, I'll press space more. I don't do animated slides, so this is a surprising uh, change. Um, classic, uh, I run Linux, so PowerPoint's not even an option. Usually I'm just using PDFs, so that's why this is a, uh, but anyhow, classic OSD hardware. All of you have seen this. If you own, own Panassas, this is an AS18. I didn't have a more recent picture of an ASH, so apologies to marketing. Um, it's a bespoke blade-based design. Uh, from the sheet metal to the motherboards, um, we don't build our own CPUs, thank God. Uh, but you know, the switches, all of this is our own uh, hardware design. And that was largely because in 2001, there wasn't an option for that. And then once we had it, moving away from it is hard because we already know what works. Um, so a bunch of the advantages are the integrated dual 10 gig E uh, that, that came out the back, just switch modules you can replace, uh, two cables coming out of the back of each, each shelf. Redundant PSUs, fans, switches, custom battery backup. Um, love it or hate it, but it gave us a huge performance advantage because now we can use RAM uh, as, as an aggressive you know, write back target and gracefully power down when you do lose power to the realm. On a per OSD basis, I mentioned you have two SATA hard drives, a SATA SSD, dual gig E, so the 10 gig E gets split up over your 11, uh, 11 OSDs, and that just turns in, you know, one gig E, you have two of those coming out of each OSD, and then 32 gigs of RAM, which acts both as our write back cache, uh, as well as, you know, uh, read cache if it's clean data. There were incremental changes every release from 12 to 14, uh, 12 to 14 was actually fairly notable because we added the SSD, but since then, 14, 16, 18, we've changed the boards when we needed to, we've added new CPUs, more RAM, different drives, but these have been incremental improvements and they've all been leading up to the evolution that we needed with Ultra. Um, but generally, I mean, the important thing here is the form factor stayed the same. You had your two hard drives, you had your one SSD, and you didn't have a ton of space to do much else. So the software stack, um, I mentioned we are in kernel, and I mean really in kernel. iSCSI and RPC, as soon as you accept those things, you're already in, in kernel and you stay in kernel all the way through to the disk. Uh, this was, I think, again, an artifact of 2001. If you wanted to be fast, if you didn't want to have a hunk in CPU in there, you were in kernel. And that makes for very difficult development, but as a result, you know, you don't need a ton of CPU to, to drive the disk pretty quickly. Um, this is loaded by the OSD monitor. It does some checks. When you start up and says, like, everything seems sane, go ahead and load, load this uh, kernel module, um, and, and it's ready to rock. OSDFS, which is basically that whole blue kernel module area, um, uh, that is the heart and soul of our OSD. Uh, it's super tightly integrated with FreeBSD, the file system area of the that OS. Um, it's proprietary, as I mentioned, um, and it interacts actually with just a single device that the Geom layer in FreeBSD will basically assemble at the bottom there. The hardware agent, uh, which is our one of our probably major in uh, current primes, but continues to be a major user space process in the OSD uh, that gives us that appliance feel because it can report on the health of an OSD. Um, that's monitoring all the hardware, at least all the hardware that we care to monitor because it, it matters to the user. Uh, and we'll report things up to uh, PanFS, your, your manageability layer, uh, whenever trouble occurs. We have some other minor user space processes that are outside the, the scope of this talk, but 
that this is basically what's inside of an OSD. One of the things I'll call out here and I'll harp on later uh, is that this is in FreeBSD 7.2. Uh, this is an old version of FreeBSD. It's been hard to move away from this, um, and that's because of the lock-in, the hardware lock-in, and the OSDFS lock-in. You know, building an in kernel so so aggressively is really powerful, and it's also dangerous. And so this is one of one of the lessons I'll call out as as learned over the, that time. So some. Prime and before, yeah. Yes. If it currently looks like a blade, it's classic. So some of the good and some of the lessons learned from each of these, these items over those 20 years. Um, admins love the modularity. That has come up in multiple talks. You know, something went wrong, you pull the blade, you put in a new blade. Um, Switch went bad, you pull the switch, you put in a new switch. Um, however, bespoke hardware design is tough, it's, it can be expensive, and it certainly can delay time to market compared to just evaluating something commodity off the shelf and adopting that as your, your next OSD. Battery-backed RAM is sweet from a performance perspective, not so sweet from like a trying to ship it to country X perspective, or ship it down the street because they're heavy, uh, and apparently dangerous weapons. Um, so that was also something that we, we learned from. Um, tight integration with FreeBSD. So we want the appliance feel. We don't want this to feel like an open source project or that you have to use open source project X, Y, or Z to monitor your storage. Um, so that's really good. Monitoring and reporting on the health of an OSD is really good. But such tight integration really locks us and has locked us into uh, FreeBSD over the years and out of other OSs, even if they seemed attractive at the time. Hard drives remain the king of capacity and are really good at bandwidth. Um, there's lots of haters about hard drives and spinning rust and this and that. Um, they're not going away anytime soon, certainly not in Ultra, uh, likely not in the rest of the market unless things change dramatically in a way that I can't, I can't foresee. But they're way, way, way huger than they used to be, and the bandwidth hasn't changed in a way that follows that trend. So getting access to all that data takes roughly 80 times longer than it did in 2005. Four other lessons. The snapshot in cow-based file system design was a winner. I mean, it, it, was, it was huge. People love snapshots. Um, you know, snapshots aren't backup, but snapshots will save you when you just deleted a whole bunch of uh, things from your engineering directory, which I do on a fairly monthly basis by accident when I'm trying to clean up. Many modern file systems that have come about in the last few years don't even try because they know it's hard and they'd rather concentrate on other things that are sexier. But it's complex. It's fragile. You know, you have to throw a lot of engineers at maintaining it and at improving it. Having most of the OSD software stack in kernel uh, was super important in 2001, probably still important in 2009, less important today, uh, and certainly a pain point in terms of debugging, um, maintenance, dealing with an OSD that's gone bad in the field and we need to figure out, you know, VM coring the whole thing is, uh, is not desirable. And so um, that, that was uh, certainly lessons learned over the long haul. Tiering small files and directories was also a hit. Uh, that was a huge change from 12s to 14s. Uh, Dale, actually, one of our SEs always tells me, you should have tried to walk the file system at, you know, on a PAS 12. Uh, it, was, it was tough. Um, and so that is, you know, th this tiering within the OSD uh, was a big hit with our customers, and I still conjecture is like uh, the way to go with most of your tiering when you care about it from like a performance perspective. But the way we did it wasn't as dynamic as it could have been. When the SSDs filled up, you know, hell ensued and you spilled the disk and you just don't want to be on hard drives with stuff that you don't want to be on hard drives with. So we have to be more dynamic about that. And last, um, the form factor I mentioned, because of this bespoke hardware design, there's two hard drives and one SSD, uh, it's a really convenient replacement unit and it's also a limiting factor when it comes to basically amortizing your CPU and RAM and networking costs over your disks to drive down the, the you know, dollars per terabyte as much as possible. 
So I'm going to rip through this because it's basically just saying how we solve these problems in Ultra. Um, you've already heard about the pluses and minuses that we are trying to solve, so I won't speak to them as much. Um, but basically on the platform, we, we wanted to find and we found that finally the market had delivered some, some acceptable COTS uh, platforms. And so we found the best one of those, those bunch, and that's what you see with Ultra. For the battery-backed RAM, NVDIMMs have finally stabilized. Uh, they're, they're still very new, but they're well tested, at least in our environments, and we've been really happy with the one that we ship in Ultra. That's where we put our intent and transaction log and basically backs up our, our metadata and ingest data in place of what used to be battery-backed RAM. FreeBSD integration. Uh, this was a huge part of the Ultra project and doesn't get talked about a lot. We wanted to be able to move OSs or even move distros without a ton of work, and so we built an entire abstraction layer between all of the monitoring and the actual, the way each individual OS or even distro or version of kernel exports hardware information. Um, and so that allows us to move not only from FreeBSD to Linux, like we did in Ultra, but also back to a newer version of FreeBSD or to a new OS should it arrive. And hard drives, uh, you know, they were sensible dollars per terabyte in 2001, they still are. And so uh, we got to solve the performance problem, and we do that with more tiering. We have three tiers, uh, by, at least by my record in, in Prime, with uh, battery-backed RAM, SSD, SATA SSD, and hard drive, and we have five in Ultra, with the MVDIM taking uh, the database transaction log and the writes, the DRAM doing mostly uh, clean, you know, read, uh, read-oriented caching, the NVMe doing, and I'll talk about this in more detail, but the NVMe doing the metadata-oriented uh, accesses, uh, and the SATA SSDs and hard drives serving small and large files, respectively. The OSD file system we designed in 2000, well, we designed it twice, but the second round was more like, I don't know, 2011 or 10. Um, that had fantastic support for copy and write and snapshots to make sure that people weren't wasting space just trying to take snapshots. Um, the you know free and open source uh, community has has given us one of them that finally is considered stable, and so we picked that up and ran with it in Linux, and have been extremely happy with it uh, so far. The kernel space existence of the OSD has been undone. We are almost entirely user space, and to deal with just the few performance hiccups that we saw, we tuned the heck out of uh, Ultra to make sure that all the system controls are, are are set appropriately for the workflows that we anticipate. The small file and directories were well loved, um, but we were doing it too statically, so we have a dynamic allocation scheme that basically redefines what small is as you fill up your SSD. Uh, this makes sure that you know, if you've sized your hardware incorrectly, which happens all the time uh, with, maybe not because you sized it wrong, but just because you're, you're, you had more users or you know, your workflow's changed or whatever, um, you don't completely spill, you just change what you're actually storing in SSD to concentrate on what most matters. And finally, the, the form factor. The form factor had to change. We moved from small to medium. You won't see a JBOD uh, uh, coming out, at least in the next couple of years, from Panassas because it's not what our architecture really speaks to. So a medium-sized OSD got us a lot of, you know, got us to the sweet spot in the knee of the curve as far as like price per terabyte went. Um, got us a ton of performance, and all we had to do to make sure that that OSD wasn't taking a lot longer to recon was to make sure that it performed well with reconstruction beyond what Prime did, uh, and we did that with Ultra. So looking at some of the hardware, um, we've partnered with the Supermicro. It's probably no surprise. People have seen the, uh, uh, the purplish supermicro y color on some of the other uh, pictures from the, the beta realms. Um, so it is a Supermicro uh, module-based design, uh, fully COTS. Um, I don't believe we change anything or ask them to change anything. Uh, it has redundant PSUs. Uh, you get four OSDs and four U, so you'll need three of these um, to, to have a realm. Uh, but there's still easy slide-in, slide-out replacement. Um, on a per-OSD basis, we go from two hard drives to six. Um, we add an NVMe SSD. To our 32 gigabytes of RAM, we've added the NVDIMM to allow for that, that safe write-back and transaction logging. And we have, uh, we're basically using the Supermicro I.O. module for networking. So right now it's dual tank, excuse me, dual 25 gig E. Um, 
but that could potentially be swapped for IB or 40 giggy or 100 giggy in the future as soon as we add software support for it. Uh, the hardware design does not need to occur. We just change out the, the I.O. module. And I would say it's the first platform in a product line. Uh, in the past, we've had a flagship product, and that flagship product changes, and it changes once per year or once every other year um, with incremental changes. I think with all of our hardware abstraction or OS abstraction support, we'll be able to support a much wider product line in the future um, to serve the needs of different fields, different customers. You know, not everybody needs a petabyte and three shelves. So uh, we'll figure that out, uh, find, find out what's right for Panassas and for those customers, and, and lay out those without as much work as bespoke hardware design. <clears throat> this OSD software stack looks quite a bit different because most of it was rewritten. The areas that weren't, uh, the, the three boxes at the top, were explicitly avoided uh, from change to make the rest of the system not have to freak out because of this huge project. So the iSCSI interfaces, RPC interfaces are exactly the same, so the PANFS you've come to know and love is exactly the same as far as PANFS is concerned. The OSDs have just changed entirely inside. Uh, one of the key, I would say, like computer science-y changes we made with the OSD was really respecting the fact that data is not metadata and you have to stop treating it the same. So for when you go to modify a component, like, as I said, that's the atomic unit of storage. Well, now I've kind of invented quarks here. Uh, you take your data side of that, that quark and you shove it onto your copy and write, you know, open source um, file system that's on SATA hard drives or SATA HDDs. But the metadata, all of your attributes, when you do like a file system walk outside of the directory that you're querying, you're looking at, um, you know, you're looking at the attributes of, of those individual files or folders. Um, that's all in a, in a database because it just made no sense to have that as like a flat object or laid out in any other silly way on the SATA SSD or hard drive. So that's in a database that's uh, fronted by the NVDIM to make transactions really fast and accelerated by NVMe SSD over SATA SSD. <clears throat> looking at that middle layer, the object orchestration layer, that's one of the most heavy software changes we've had to make because it deals with all of the, this division, you know, between our atomic unit, the, the data and the metadata, uh, making, making sure that consistency is maintained um, between the data store and the metadata store, which is what we call them. Um, and the NVDIM power fail protection, you know, this is broken up, so we use about, um, about a half a gig for the transaction log for our database, our metadata changes, um, and the rest of it's all for writes. So ingest, you know, incoming writes will get placed here. But it's really important to realize this isn't just a write back. So we wanted to leverage Linux's like async IO, which has been like heavily tuned over the years as much as possible. So we spent six months trying to do the write back cache thing only to realize, hey, when you call sync, even if you call sync to an NVDIM, it will fragment and change the way that you access your data when it actually hits the hard drive under the covers. So we only use that intent log if you lose power. Otherwise, we identify when that thing's been safely synced to disk and we just ditch it. It never goes through the NVDIM to disk. It just stays out of the way unless it's absolutely needed, which is how we maximize performance in Ultra. Looking at the uh, now mostly light blue area, you can see almost everything's in user space, uh, which has been a boon to engineers and has made my life incredibly <laughs> nicer um, and allowed us to get the project out on time. So all of this, if, it, if you hit a bug, you're not crashing the kernel, you're restarting the IO path. And it has replay and all kinds of features to basically come back up, figure out what it crashed on, and avoid crashing on that again. So it'll come up like that. You'll see something that said IO path has been restarted, but your OSD never went down. You don't have to wait for it to reboot. You don't have to get a kernel core. It might tell you a core exists on the file system, but it's no different than any user space process as a result. And that allows for not only my life to be much better, but hopefully your lives to be better. So far, it's just as fast as in kernel. Again, we're leveraging that you know, open source copy and write file system for a lot of the like heavy lifting around snapshots and, and you know, on a per block basis, you know, out figuring out where blocks are allocated. So we can stay out of kernel and let it do its job um, and just concentrate on what the parallel file system actually cares about. 
and the platform OS independence layer that I've harped on because it's been, it's been huge for hardware monitoring for us. So in conclusion, uh, the time was right. I feel like just a number of things came together uh, to make Ultra not only possible, but like something that we needed to do, wanted to do, and like had to happen for the field. Um, we had a lengthy history to like look back on and say, what did we do right with OSDs and what did we do wrong? And make sure that we keep the good and ditch the bad. Um, the media types just keep diversifying from NVDIMs. Uh, there's a, a variety of other non-volatile memory that's coming out now that we are considering as soon as it comes out. Um, new types of SSDs. Um, the COTS hardware platform finally made sense for us. It didn't for at least a decade after our inception. Um, and stabilized free and open source software that we could leverage some of our file system on. So from like a perspective, from PanFS's perspective, you know, Panassis's perspective, as well as like what the customers can come to expect as a result of not only Ultra in this release, but like future releases, it gives us portability so we can move from platform to platform, OS to OS, without like a ton of overhead and change. Um, we can use COTS as part of that portability um, and, and stay class leading and not have to reinvent, you know, some of the work that Supermicro is doing or a different vendor if we move to a different vendor. Um, tiering and density uh, has greatly improved. Metadata is treated completely separate from data, which we think is extremely novel. Uh, and one of the, we believe we're the only one that's currently doing that on a, you know, per storage target basis. And time, it frees up time for engineering to work on some of the things that you guys really care about, which are additional features for our parallel file system. So, anybody have questions? I've got one. Uh, why did you uh, pick Susie? That's a really good question. Uh, <laughs> so we looked at at least seven distros. Um, Open Suze, in particular, uh, uh, Suze would have been too expensive. Uh, <laughs> uh, Open Suze uses uh, that specific open source file system as their root and main home file system. So all the Open Suze machines in the world basically back up our bet on that file system. And as Suze does the same thing. Uh, so that, that exact same file system is in use. And so we felt that the stability was there, but stability today doesn't mean stability tomorrow. And having a major, a major vendor back it like that uh, gave us a lot of confidence that it would, it would stay stable going forward. And it certainly has over the development of this project. Any other questions? Yeah, so now that you have um, your metadata in NVMe, what, um, what would it take to get a realm-wide metadata database? Can you better define what you mean by realm-wide? In, in other words, a single place to go in a database format for me to know everything there is to know about what's on my, on my storage without having to scour the entire tree of directories to find out who's, who's using the most memory. Yeah, so I'll, I'll give you my view of it um, at, from a higher level, right? That we have a database full of metadata. What you're really looking for is a REST API that will come in and issue a query in parallel to all the OSDs at yeah. once. They'll all do their, their match and pull out the data that, that matches and bring it back to the, uh, the, the director, which will then reduce it. So this is MapReduce. So that's something that we've talked about. It's not in the product yet. Yeah. And one of the other things is like, you know, as Nick called out in his like picture that showed like a full rack, you know, what's a full rack gonna look like with ultras in it? And it's 60 terabytes of MVME, right? So if you wanna have that in one database, all of a sudden you need like a parallel file system to store the parallel file system's uh, attributes. So I think it's going to depend on what you're trying to solve. So we talked about Robinhood a little bit earlier, like as like a, if you wanna efficiently figure out what's changed in the file system to track users or something like that, I think that's only really concerned with a subset of the attributes that we store. Um, and that's where you can use like an external third party software to do that and, and take advantage of our Snap, Snap Delta diff, um, sorry, our Snap Delta tool to efficiently keep track of those things. If you're trying to do it in a more general sense than what Curtis is talking about is certainly the way to go where you basically, you wanna move your, your compute, your query 
to the OSDs. I mean, they're basically your parallel database. And so it, if we can come up with more intelligent ways to change the, uh, our currently iSCSI layer and add different command sets to that, that will, that makes sense for what our customers care about, then we'll do that. But I think we got to talk about the problem you're trying to solve first to make sure that that, that achieves what you need. be able to know what's on the database without having to, without imposing an impact on the entire storage environment. Right, and that's that's one of the main reasons we segmented it out, right? Because a lot of people will do, you know, chown recursively or something terrible, right? And that that's that's what we were trying to solve for. So I think I think these are well aligned. I think just coming up with the right API to give um, the right types of people access to uh, to that. NVMe database uh, is what, what we got to figure out. So, thanks, Alice.